Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very uh, much for uh, arriving in good time for our first plenary uh, this morning. Uh, let me first of all thank His Royal Highness Prince Salman, the Crown Prince and Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Bahrain, for his patronage of our uh, excellent dinner last night, Deputy Prime Minister Sheikh Mohammed bin Mubarak Al Khalifa, uh, for his hosting it uh, on behalf of the uh, uh, Prime Minister and Crown Prince. And uh, my warm thanks to uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, Minister of Defense Prabhu of uh, Indonesia for his excellent remarks last night that reminded us of the uh, codependence of the Middle East and Indo-Pacific strategic uh, theaters and therefore of the important collegial relations that need to be uh, maintained as between uh, the leaders in those uh, two regions. We have a full day of plenaries uh, today, concluding smartly at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, let me remind everybody that the remarks that are being made from this stage are on the record. Uh, also, the question and answer period that follows each of the plenaries are on the record. I'd like to remind people that uh, just like the answers are on the record, uh, the questions are on the record, so make certain that you uh, are uh, crisp and responsible and uh, maintain your own reputations as you ask your questions, not only uh, be mindful of the reputations of those who have to answer from the stage. When we do move from uh, the Q&A, we have a, a very good technology here uh, by which we seek uh, the floor. Uh, each of you have a white badge. Uh, if you put your white badge on the side of your uh, microphone and then press uh, the button. Uh, the microphone will turn green. <clears throat> Confidence building note, that does not mean your microphone is on. That only means that I see your name and your desire to seek the floor on here. I alone can turn on your microphone. I alone can also turn it off. Uh, so I do remind you to ask your questions uh, crisply, but that means that we can move quite smartly uh, from the presentations into uh, the questions. Um, and so I do invite you all who might want the floor to put your badges in now, and then if you decide to ask a question, just press the, the speaker microphone. We're really delighted that this uh, first plenary as has become uh, a tradition at the IISS Manama uh, Dialogue is being addressed uh, by the U.S. Uh, Secretary of Defense. We've had Secretary Gates, Secretary Carter, Secretary Mattis, uh, others uh, speak from this stage, but it's uh, really tremendous to have uh, Secretary Austin here because very uh, few uh, Secretaries of Defense will have immediately pr prior to their uh, assuming the office of Secretary of uh, defense had uh, so much uh, experience in this uh, theater. As all of you know, he was the CENTCOM commander. He, in fact, attended a couple of Manama dialogues uh, in that capacity. And as I think you all know, um, the um, uh, combatant commanders of the uh, United States uh, obviously have responsibility for all uh, actual and prospective military operations in their theater. Uh, but day to day, they also engage in a tremendous amount of defense diplomacy. They are the ones who go around and speak to the ministers of defense, quite often the crown princes, uh, the emirs of the region, uh, to build confidence in the way in which the United States engages uh, in this uh, region. So Secretary Austin brings that wealth of experience uh, to this first plenary. And with that, I would invite him to take the stage and address uh, the Manama Dialogue on the theme, uh, U.S. Defense Policy in the Middle East. Well, thank you very much, and good morning. John, thanks for that kind introduction. And let me thank His Majesty King Hamad and Crown Prince Salman and the wonderful people of Bahrain for their, their warm hospitality. I'm really glad to be back in Bahrain. And it's good to be back at IISS, which does so much to deepen our dialogue on global security. And it's especially good to be here at the Manama Dialogue, despite all the challenges of the pandemic. Now, I last spoke to IISS in Singapore in July. And I'm relieved that I seem to have done well enough to rate a return invite. <laughs> but back in July, I spoke about the strategic imperative of partnership. And I'd like to return to that theme today. I'd also like to lay out a broader shared vision of 21st century security in the Middle East. Because over my many years in this region, 
I've learned that we can do so much more when we come together than when we, when we let ourselves be split apart. Just look at the new relationships being forged today by Israel, Bahrain, the UAE, Morocco, and others, opening up new opportunities for shared responsibility, and shared prosperity, and security cooperation, and people-to-people -people ties. And I'm pleased that our unified command plan has rightfully shifted Israel to CENTCOM's area of responsibility. And all that just underscores the changes that can take place in this region. And it shows the growing power of partnership in today's world, one woven closer and closer together by technology and trade. In 2001, my great friend and mentor, the late Colin Powell, underscored how profoundly America is linked to the 24, 21st century world. As he said, there is no country in the world that does not touch us. We are a country of countries, with a citizen in our ranks from, from every land. We are attached by a thousand cords to the world at large to its teeming cities, to its remotest regions, to its oldest civilizations, to its newest cries for freedom. And in that world of many chords, we face a range of common challenges, including lingering conflicts and 21st century threats that can cross borders with the ease and fury of a storm. And so, ladies and gentlemen, those common perils demand common action. I learned that lesson in this region wearing the cloth of the United States Army. And my years in uniform taught me that a, a nation that tries to go it alone is a nation that is less secure. Now, that isn't some abstract piece of political science theory. It's hard-won experience from the field of battle. When I commanded CENTCOM, we relied on a coalition of 60 countries. And I know this region. My country has invested deeply here. I've led troops into battle here and I care a great deal about its security, its people, and its future. Now, I'm here as a representative of the Biden administration. But for decades, American administrations from both parties have recognized the profound importance of our partnerships in the Middle East and North Africa. We do crucial work together with our friends in this region to deter aggression from any quarter, to disrupt terrorist networks, and to maintain freedom of navigation in some of the world's most important waterways. And over the decades, we have worked side by side as you invested in capabilities to defend yourselves. And we've supported you along the way, and we're going to keep doing so. Our forces train together, plan together, and work together. And that makes us stronger together. And the whole world saw what that means just a few months ago during Operation Allies Refuge. As we wound down the 20-year war in Afghanistan, the world witnessed again the power of our network of partnerships. When America asked for help, our friends stood up. And leadership from this region helped us to evacuate 124,000 people from Afghanistan and to provide safe transit for them in the Gulf and beyond. You know, I'm incredibly proud of the troops who wage this mission of mercy 
and of the partners who race to save innocents in harm's way. Our network of allies and partners in the Middle East and beyond is a huge force multiplier. It's a vast strategic advantage. It is unmatched, it is unparalleled, and it is unrivaled. And we are deeply grateful. From President Biden on down, we're committed to strengthening the bonds between governments of goodwill and, work, and to working to, together to expand the circle of security and opportunity and self-government and human dignity. So we're going to build on our long-standing investments in this crucial region, in security cooperation and training in professional military education, capacity building, and intelligence sharing, and joint exercises. It is a core part of my mission as Secretary of Defense to deepen and widen our partnerships. And so, I'd like to talk today about two key ways in which we're doing that. First, that means updating and upgrading our relationships with our friends. And working together with you as you advance what I call integrated deterrence against the challenges of the 21st century. And second, it means understanding that many of the region's most urgent security threats transcend borders. And it means tackling them through determined multilateral efforts. Now, we all need to start with some humility. I've seen more than enough combat in this region to understand the limits of what military force alone can do. You know, I work in a building with plenty of hammers. But that doesn't mean that everything around us is a nail. As President Eisenhower put it in 1956, Arms alone can give the world no permanent peace and no confident security. Arms are solely for defense, to protect from violent assault what we already have. So President Biden made clear in his interim national security guidance that diplomacy is America's tool of first resort and that the U.S. military is here to buttress it. Leading with diplomacy and using all instruments of national power are central to the new national defense strategy that the Department of Defense is working on and its cornerstone concept of integrated deterrence. As we have throughout America's history, we're going to make something clear to any potential adversary, and that is that the cost and the risk of aggression are out of line with any possible benefit. And in the 21st century, that means weaving together cutting-edge technology and operational concepts and state-of-the-art co capabilities to prevent conflict and to seamlessly dissuade aggression in any form or forum using every instrument of national power. <clears throat> and to deter across every domain and through every, every, throughout every theater and from every foe. In the Middle East and North Africa, integrated deterrence means synchronizing our actions and capabilities with those of our partners and allies. It means greater interoperability and communication and innovation. And it means working with our friends to deter aggression in space and cyberspace, as well as air, land, and sea. You're not getting off that easy.
Now, as CENTCOM commander, I saw firsthand the way that the number of U.S. troops and capabilities across this region ebb and flow. The United States is a global power with global responsibilities, including making sure that our troops are ready and modernized. But we have very real combat power in this theater, and we can and will maintain it. And if needed, we will move in more, and we will move it in rapidly. Because that's also what a global power does. And no one should doubt our resolve or our capabilities to defend ourselves and all those who work alongside us to keep this region secure. We're focused on 21st century threats, and that means more dynamic and agile and tailored deployments that give pause to any potential foe. Our potential punch includes what our friends can contribute and what we have pre-positioned and what we can rapidly flow in. And our friends and foes both know that the United States can deploy overwhelming force at the time and place of our choosing. And so ultimately, our mission is to support diplomacy and to deter conflict and to defend the United States in our vital interests. And if we're forced to turn back aggression, we will win, and we will win decisively. <clears throat> All of this involves constantly evaluating and updating our global posture. But let's be clear. America's commitment to security in the Middle East is strong and sure. So we'll defend our interest in this region, and we'll continue to evaluate the right mix of forces to bolster our deterrence against Iran. And we'll protect our forces from attack by Tehran or its proxies. And we'll work together to ensure that ISIS can't reconstitute itself in Iraq and Syria. <clears throat> and we'll continue to support freedom of navigation in the region's vital, vital waterways. We'll drive to end lingering conflicts, and we'll keep up our relentless focus on counterterrorism, even as we shift to an over-the-horizon concept in Afghanistan. So we've got a lot to do, and we're going to do, do it together. That means standing up for our interests and our principles and our friends. It means that we stand up for democracy in Tunisia and hope to see a rapid return to constitutional order. It means that we stand up for Iraq's sovereignty and independence against any party or proxy that tries to violate it. And it means that we stand by the people of Lebanon in this terrible hour of need. It means that our commitment to Israel's security is ironclad. And it means that we continue to work towards progress toward a two-state solution for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And that means that we continue to work to end the tragic war in Yemen, to call on the Houthis to stop their attacks both on Saudi territory and inside Yemen, and to end the suffering of the Yemeni people. And it means that we continue to buttress this region's security architecture through military-to-military -military cooperation, training, and joint exercises. Yet, we also must be ready for big changes in our security environment. And that leads me to my second major point. In the 21st century, we need a broader view of Middle Eastern security. And we all need, a deeper, multilater all need deeper multilateral partnerships to tackle shared threats. Many of today's most urgent dangers just don't care about borders. From the pandemic and climate change to nuclear proliferation, and unmanned aerial systems, and violent extremist groups, and Iran, Iranian support for terrorism. You know, America can't confront these common challenges alone, and so we must tackle shared, shared dangers together with the full power of partnership. That's why President Biden has personally directed his entire national security team to reinvigorate and reinvest in our alliances and partnerships. And in this region, we, can, we see how cooperation can make us all safer on front after front. Consider the coalition to defeat ISIS, 
Its members are training and advising and assisting local partners in Iraq and Syria, and helping to stabilize areas liberated from ISIS's cruelty and giving critical services and aid to people freed from ISIS's rule. Or think of our work with partners in the Gulf, where we've joined an important international effort to help Saudi Arabia strengthen its air defenses, boosting its own capabilities and contributing air defense systems alongside Greece, United Kingdom, and France. Or look offshore, where the U.S.-founded international maritime security construct is defending freedom of navigation for all, and not just for navies, but for civilian shipping as well, thanks to firm leadership from the UK and from our regional partners helping to patrol their territorial waters. But you know, we've still got much more to do together. So I'd like to say just a few words about four of the most pressing challenges that we all face, the pandemic, climate change, terrorism, and Iran. First, the pandemic. We can't beat COVID-19 by leaving it to smolder in some parts of the planet. This terrible disease has been a body blow to every country on Earth. So we're proud to support our regional partners with vaccines, and medical supplies, and economic aid. And we're proud to be the largest global donor to COVAX. You know, we've donated more than 8.2 million life-saving vaccine doses in this region, including donations to Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Morocco, the Palestinian territories, Tunisia, and Yemen. And we're going to keep driving hard with our partners to end this pandemic for everyone, everywhere. And second, we're intensely focused on the climate crisis. It is an existential threat. All countries will be far less secure in a warming world that's stressed and volatile and chaotic. And it's easy to see the risk of new uh, Middle East conflicts in jostling over resources that span borders. So we really don't have time to lose. And the Department of Defense is doing its part, moving quickly to cut down on our own emissions and improve the energy efficiency of our bases and ships and airplanes and deploy clean energy technologies that reduce our carbon footprint. As President Biden said in Glasgow, this is a challenge of our collective lifetimes. We can do this. We just have to make a choice to do it. And third, we must work together to combat terrorism, including in Afghanistan, from Al-Qaeda, and from the malice and sectarian hatred of ISIS. As I made clear last month when I convened the members of the Defeat ISIS Coalition during the NATO Defense Ministerial, the United States remains committed to supporting our partners in Iraq and Syria to ensure the enduring defeat of ISIS. But let's also understand where we are. Twenty years after 9-11, the United States is a more resilient nation and one that's better equipped to prevent attacks on our civilians. So we'll continue to strengthen our partnerships to dismantle terrorist networks, including throttling their financing and countering their propaganda and blocking their travel. And we'll meet threats targeting American civilians with our full range of capabilities. And fourth and finally, I know that many of us share deep concerns about the Iranian government's destabilizing actions, including its support for terrorism, its dangerous proxies, and its nuclear program. The United States remains committed to preventing Iran from gaining a nuclear weapon. And we remain committed to a, a diplomatic outcome of the nuclear issue. But if Iran isn't willing to engage seriously, then we will look at all the options necessary to keep the United States secure. Now, next week, Iran's negotiating team is set to return to Vienna to restart talks on a mutual return to compliance with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. We and our partners will return to those talks in good faith. But Iran's actions in recent months have not been encouraging, especially because of the expansion of their nuclear program. As my friend 
and colleague, Secretary of State Blinken, has said, Iran's nuclear activities are bringing us closer to the point at which returning to the JCPOA won't recapture its benefits. But if Iran comes back with constructive positions, we still think we can quickly resolve our lingering differences to make a mutual return to the JCPOA possible. Yet, Iran presents us all with serious security challenges that go beyond its nuclear program. Iran stokes, stokes tensions in this region and beyond, and that undermines peace and stability for us all. Now, Iran's neighbors have tried to talk and improve relations, and we fully support those efforts. And we urge Iran to do its part to take steps to reduce violence and conflict. But whatever Iran decides, we will continue to work closely, closely with our partners. Iran should have no illusions that it can undermine our strong relationships in this region. And we will defend ourselves. And we will defend our friends. And we will defend our interests. And that includes tackling the dangerous use of unmanned aircraft systems. Iran's proliferation of one-way attack UAVs is a constant threat to American troops and a hindrance to the fight in the fight against ISIS. And as we've seen in Iraq, in Saudi Arabia, and elsewhere, many of our partners face the same threat every day. And this is more than just a Middle East problem. Such systems are likely to feature prominently in the conflicts of the future, and they already threaten civilian aircraft. And that's why my department has made it a priority to address the drone threat. We're bringing the region together to tackle, to tackle it, including through joint exercises and training in places such as the UAE Warfare Center. For 17 years now, we've joined with the UAE to bring together air forces from the Gulf and beyond to train and integrate together. We also have a range of systems deployed in the region that have already thwarted drone, drone attacks. And thanks to our shared investments, our partners here have their own formidable capabilities to handle the dangers from UAVs. And we're significantly enhancing Saudi Arabia's ability to defend itself. Saudi ground and air forces are now defeating nearly 90% of UAVs and missiles fired from Yemen. And we'll work with them until it's 100%. America's commitment to helping our friends defend their sovereign space is unwavering. So we're also helping our Gulf partners defend themselves against threats from Houthi forces in Yemen including not just drones, but also ballistic missiles and explosive boats. And across the Middle East, we're supporting efforts to better integrate air and missile defenses and to strengthen regional security cooperation and to interdict dangerous materials at sea. That's because the threats posed by Iran and its proxies are too widespread for any of us to go it alone. We must work together to share information and to support regional air defenses, and to join in mutual defense. And if Iran truly wants to rejoin the international community, it must return to international norms. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that's a big agenda, but we're determined to get it done, together. We can all move to a new era, era of partnership, one in which multilateral efforts tackle shared threats, and operations are more integrated, and defense relationships grow deeper. And let me again echo Colin Powell. America is attached by a thousand cords to the world and to this region. So we'll work together to make this region more stable and secure. We'll work together to make this region more prosperous and just. And we'll work together to give all this region's children the chance to reach their God-given potential. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for those remarks, and especially for reminding us that military deterrence and defense uh, is uh, about uh, movement and about the capability to flow forces between theaters, not just uh, a question of stationing them uh, within them. And for your quad of, um, as I might put it, of, of security challenges that we all face, we've got time for a few questions, so I'll take uh, two or three in, in, in a quick bunch and then turn to the Secretary for uh, his responses. First from Saudi Arabia, I have uh, Shahad Turkistani. Your microphone is on. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, Secretary Austin, for your uh, valuable remarks. Uh, my name is Shahad Turkistani. I'm from Saudi Arabia and a graduate student at the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, my, my question is regarding the maritime security of the region. So amidst the rising influence of global actors uh, in the region, and especially in the waters of the Gulf, what assurances can, the, can our longest ally, the United States, provide to provide to its Gulf allies and um, Middle Eastern allies in general about the maritime security that are vital to stability and security of international trade and the energy market. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. And from Iraq, uh, could I ask uh, Farad al-Adin, the chairman of the Iraq Advisory Council. Thank you. Good morning. Farhad al-Adin, chairman of Iraq Advisory Council. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you for your remarks. Um, how do you assess the potency of ISIS in Iraq and Syria, especially, uh, that now you are on the clock to withdraw your combat troops uh, from Iraq by 31st of December? And um, especially this region now fearing uh, your reduction of footprint in general, especially after Afghanistan. So there are a lot of worries here, and your partners in the region really behind the scenes are worried, and some of them are starting to run for cover. Uh, how you provide real assurances uh, that these fears should not be realized? And the third question before I come back to the Secretary from Reuters and Canada, Idris Ali. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Um, every four or eight years, uh, a new U.S. administration seems to come to power with a different approach to Iran, whether it's maximum pressure uh, to now reviving nuclear talks. Um, in addition, you're coming to the region without any new commitments, whether that's forces or weapons. Um, my question is, why should allies um, and countries in the region believe and trust the Biden administration when you say uh, you're committed to the region, and how can you uh, convince them that things won't change uh, four years from now? Mr. Secretary. Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I guess I get the chance to choose one of these questions to answer, right? <laughs> but I think there's a common theme here, and, and uh, that common theme is, is reassurance. Uh, there, there is some level of angst, as I just heard, that uh, you know, the United States is not really committed to this region, uh, and that uh, because you've heard us say, you've heard me say, that uh, our pacing challenge is China. And so there's an anticipation that we're going we're gonna to turn and focus everything that we have on China. Um, I not only have heard that in this region, I've also heard that in Europe and some other places. And so, I, as I said in my remarks, the United States of America is a global power. And we have uh, interests that we uh, have to protect uh, all around the globe. And, and so, we can do that because we have this vast network of uh, allies and partners. And you've seen that network uh, in play. You most recently saw it in play, as I said, uh, as we evacuated 124,000 people from, uh, from Afghanistan. We could not have done that without our partners and allies in this region. And so uh, we remain committed to this region. We still have tens of thousands of, uh, of troops in this region. We have significant capability here. And as a person who has fought here for, you know, a number of years defending uh, interest in this region, uh, let me assure you that we're not, you know, we're not, we're not going to abandon those interests going forward. Uh, so what you see us doing in terms of 
working with allies and partners to protect uh, these important waterways that, uh, that are in this region, or working with uh, allies and partners to, uh, to begin to knit together in a more coherent way uh, our air and missile defenses. You can expect that we'll continue to do that. It's important to us. You are important to us. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that, you know, well, I don't think, I know that you'll see a commitment to this region for, uh, for many, many years to come. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll take a couple more, and then we'll close maybe from uh, Israel. Uh, Barak Ravid, your microphone is on. Thank you. Um, Mr. Secretary, I will continue the line that uh, my colleagues started uh, before. Uh, you said that um, you work with hammers, but not uh, everything is, uh, is a nail. But uh, it, many people in the region uh, have the perception that the U.S. stopped using hammers at all, and that it doesn't want to use hammers at any cost. And we've just seen lately an attack on the U.S. base in El Tanf in Syria with no U.S. reaction at all. And uh, that kind of uh, behavior creates a lot of doubts in the region about the willingness of the U.S. to fight. Well, let me dispel that doubt. The United States of America maintains the right to defend itself. And we will defend ourselves and our interests, no matter what at the time and place of our choosing. And let no country, let no individual may, uh, be mistaken about that. We are committed to defending ourselves and our interests, and that includes our partners as well. And we're also committed to not allowing Iran to get a nuclear weapon. Thanks so much. I'll take one more from the U.S., Stephen Kalin. Hi, thank you. Um, Stephen Kalin. Stephen Kalin from the Wall Street Journal. Um, Mr. Secretary, I wanted to ask you, you, you talked um, in, your, in your remarks about um, how America's friends stood up for it uh, with, during the Afghanistan evacuation. But as, as some of the others um, in the audience have, have remarked, the, the sense from the region, um, in many parts of the region, um, was that America's partners were being asked to do more, um, and yet America is seen as a less reliable partner. So I'm wondering how you resolve that, and as you press for this over-the-horizon counterterrorism strategy in Afghanistan, um, which relies more on partners to help project power from further away, um, how does that dynamic play into this strategy? I'm just going to get one quickie in from Mina al-Arabi from the uh, UAE, but actually from Iraq, uh, editor of the National in the UAE. Mina? Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you about Iraq because there's talk that the U.S. will withdraw its troops from Iraq or at least end combat operations. But as somebody who knows Iraq well, uh, Mr. Secretary, we've seen this before where the U.S. says it ends its combat operations in Iraq. So what is the position on the troops in Iraq and what will be the case in January 2022, please? What, what you've heard us say is that uh, we, we have shifted to uh, focusing on training and enabling uh, the Iraqi security forces. And so our focus is on making sure that uh, we provide the Iraqi security forces, the Iraqi government, uh, you know, the training, the resources that they need to, to continue to mature its forces. And uh, as you've mentioned, I, I know those forces pretty well. Uh, and, and the other issue is, of course, uh, there was a question about uh, the capability of, of ISIS earlier. We remain concerned about ISIS. The Iraqi government remains concerned about ISIS. And we'll do everything we can to, uh, to help uh, support the Iraqi government in making sure that ISIS doesn't have the ability to, uh, to regenerate. And so, we were, you know, our efforts uh, remain focused on training and enabling and helping the Iraqi security forces also keep pressure on, uh, on ISIS. Um, and we are there at the, uh, at the invitation of the Iraqi government. So we have a great relationship and we'll continue to work to provide uh, the Iraqi government uh, what they need. In terms of the question earlier about, you know, how can we reassure our allies that, uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to be there? Uh, this is a question that I hear not only from this region, but from other regions as well. You know, we, 
We'll continue to support uh, and work with our allies as we have in the past. We'll do that through joint operations, uh, training, intelligence sharing, uh, and, ag and again, uh, we still have tens of thousands of forces uh, positioned in this region. So our commitment here is strong and sure, and uh, I look forward to continuing to work with, uh, with our, our partners in this region. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much. Do you think we can squeeze in one more question? Uh, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Nuf Alawadi from Bahrain. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my question sort of touches upon the, the rest of the questions that were asked earlier in terms of the changes in administration. So with each administration, we have a change in foreign policy. So what we've noticed in this administration is the disengagement from Afghanistan. Uh, the question I wanted to ask, uh, for the sake of time, is that after the withdrawal, would we see in the future the, re the U.S. re-engaging in Afghanistan? We remain focused on making sure currently that we can continue to get out uh, those uh, American citizens and legal permanent res residents that, uh, that want to come out of Afghanistan. Uh, and so we'll continue to work, uh, work to do that. We also remain uh, concerned about uh, the future of uh, uh, women and girls in the, in the country of Afghanistan and, and, and hopefully uh, through supporting uh, uh, non-governmental agencies that are, that are focused on those types of issues, we can, we can continue to provide support. In terms of what the government uh, will eventually uh, develop into, that's hard to predict and our relationship with with any future government, again, is, uh, is undetermined at this point. But that's a, that's a work in progress, and, uh, and so, you know, we'll see what happens. But, but again, for the, for the uh, immediate term, we remain focused on uh, making sure that we can continue to get our American citizens out uh, that, that want to come out. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for honoring us with your uh, presence here. Good luck on the defense diplomacy that you'll conduct over the next couple of days uh, here in the region. Thank you very much for your strategic patience in tolerating my squeezing in as many questions as I reasonably could in the time frame that we had, and uh, allow us all to thank you for uh, attending the Manama Dialogue and giving us such a splendid presentation of U.S. policy in the region. John, thanks for the invite, and, and I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to come back and engage with some old friends. And uh, again, I look forward to continuing to work uh, with my partners and allies in this region that uh, you know I've worked with for so long. Again, we have been here through no a number of administrations, and you can look for us to continue to do the same kinds of things going forward.